Okay, today we are going to have a look at uh, engineering materials, material testing. What are the material testings? Why we do it? And what's the reason of uh, doing the uh, material testing? Some of you might be involved in the material testing. I know you're, one of your companies got a really good material testing lab very close by. Um, so we need to make sure before we test, before we, uh, when we manufacture our material, when we get the material, we need to make sure it conforms the standard. If the standards are not met, maybe it's no use making the product of a certain material. Even after we make a product, we want to make sure we perform some testing to make sure like it's strong enough, um, it just meets all the standards and so on. So there are different types of testing we do. Some testings are destructive testing, some testings are non-destructive testing. Okay, so why are metal tested? To ensure the quality, to find out the properties of the material, <coughs> to prevent the failure in use. So we want to make sure the material is strong enough. It is not going to fail under a certain load. And sometimes we use that one to make sure which material is best, to select the best possible material. Sometimes we do it to find out the factor of safety, incorporate the factor of safety. Factor of safety is comparing the stress the material can take uh, and the actual stress that will be on the material before it actually fails. For example, if you are making a crane, the crane will fail at let's say 2000 megapascal of the stress. So you want to make sure when we are using it, the load does not exceed more than a thousand pascal. So that means the factor of safety is, is two. In lift, maybe 10 people lift is designed to actually um, with, uh, withhold, uh, let's say it's 15 people, but inside they put like, oh, sorry, only seven people are allowed. So that's a factor of safety of around two, two point something. Now, again, two types of testing. One is called the destructive testing and one is called the non-destructive testing. Mechanical testing is known as destructive testing, where you destroy the specimen and the material is no longer fit for purpose, is no longer fit for uh, the application. You have to make another one. Non-destructive testing is non-invasive testing technique where we test the material, but we can still, after we get the result, we can still use the material for the same purpose. So the material, we don't discard the material. Okay, there are different types of testing. One of the testing is known as hardness testing. It's the ability to withstand or resist indentation or the scratch. Now, what actually happened is we have a liver, we have a dial. Now, we just put the specimen that we need to test and we just put the indenter on the top. And then what we do is we actually apply the load. We activate the liver and we apply the load. The loads are applied in two different forms. First, we apply the minor load. Then we apply the major load. The minor load is applied. So we make sure the, the uh, indenter is on top of the metal. And then we apply the major load. Now, when we apply the major load, the indent will form uh, indentation in the material. If the material is soft, the indentation size will be more. If the material is hard, the indentation size will be less, which means it will form a small indent or a big indent. And then we can read the reading from here. We can convert the reading into different types of the hardness testing as well, because there are different scales, Brinell, Wicker, Noop, different hardness testing. We will have a look at that in a minute. Now we got the, the most commonly used is called Brinell hardness testing. We use a ball shaped indenter. The diameter of the ball is 10, five or one millimeter. That's the diameter of the ball. It's a hardened steel ball. Sometimes we use a tungsten carbide ball. So the outer layer is tungsten carbide. We cannot use it for very thin material. There is a rule uh, we have to follow how thick the material should be how the material should look like. And 
if you are doing the one hardness testing, obviously we need to do at least three, four different uh, places. How far one place should be from the other while we are doing the hardness testing? We cannot use it for super hard material because the ball will deform. And we just measure the surface area of the indentation. And then there is a formula. We put the thing in the formula to find out the hardness testing. We have a look at the formula, how we can work it out. Okay. Then we got the Wicker hardness testing. The Wicker hardness testing use a square shaped pyramid indenter. So it's a square shaped pyramid indenter. Now the angle between that is 136. The angle is 136. It's give you more accurate result as compared to the brittle hardness testing. What we do is we measure the length of the diagonals, the D1 and D2, and we just put in the formula or sometimes machines automatically give us a result and we can find out the hardness value. We use it for hard material, more hard than we use. It. If we can't use a brinnel, the materials are hard. We use a diamond indenter uh, because diamond is the hardest known substance. And we can actually use that one to find the hardness of the hard, hard material. Then we got the Rockwell hardness. Rockwell hardness is kind of mixture between the brinnel and the wicker hardness. Okay, so they are two different balls. One is called the ball B and one is called the a cone C. B is for ball, C is for uh, cone. If we're using the ball, this is for the soft material. If we're using the cone, that's for the hard material. And this is diamond indented, diamond cones. They're industrial diamonds, so not very expensive. They are quick, easy to use. It's a lot better than having two different systems, Brinnell system and the Wicker system. So we have a Rockwell system. We can do the hard and the soft material together. And then it just gives you the hardness value straight on the scale, depending on like how much it has penetrated into the material. And we can find the hardness value. Now, the next bit is the impact testing. Impact is the ability to withstand um, the, well, toughness is the ability to withstand the impact. Or toughness is the ability to absorb the energy before the material fails, before the material fails. So, to do find out how much energy the material can absorb, uh, how tough the material is, we do the impact testing. Now there are two different types of impact testing. One is called the uh, ISO test. One is called the uh, Sharpie impact test. They both give you the same kind of result, but the standards are different. They both follow the different standards uh, in terms of how the specimen should be placed vertically or horizontally, what is the knot size in the specimen, and where the hammer is going to hit the specimen. It's going to hit the specimen on the knot surface, or it will hit the specimen behind the knot surface. Okay, let's have a look at that one. Okay, now, what we do in the Charpy impact testing, we just put the specimen here, Oh no, sorry, this is um, not the Charpy. This, the vertical specimen, we put that one for ISO. So this is ISO impact testing. Okay, for ISO impact testing, we have a specimen. We create a notch in the specimen. Let me just show you quickly a notch in the specimen. So this is how we create a notch. The notch has specific dimension. Yeah, it should follow the specific dimension. If we are doing the ISO testing, we put the specimen notch facing towards where the hammer is going to hit. Yeah. The test specimen is held vertically in the ISO. And then we release the hammer. We release the hammer. The hammer is, we set the needle, energy scale needle to zero. 
we raise the hammer, the hammer has some potential energy because this is a quite a heavy hammer, cast iron kind of thing. We release it, it will actually go all the way. And some of the, when it hits that thing, some of the energy is used to break this specimen. And then it will bring the needle up. So just by looking at the needle, we can tell on the energy meter scale, we can tell how much energy has been absorbed. If we're doing ISO, it's the position is vertical and you hit on the face on where the notch is and the specimen is vertical. If we're doing the Charpy impact testing, it's different. In Charpy impact testing, it strikes from a high energy position with 300 joules of energy and the hammer hits at the back of the notch. The notch, uh, the specimen is not in vertical, but in horizontal position. And they are different dimension for the notch as well. The notch should face away from the striker the, or the hammer. After that one, we use um, for the tensile testing or compression testing. We use tensile testing. Now tensile testing is an ability to carry out, to find out the tensile stress of a material. We apply the tensile force. Tensile force is that way. Compressive force is inward. We can find out the stress, the strain, the elasticity, the ductility, the shear stress. We can get an idea about that material. The specimen can be round, flat, tubular, rectangular, any shape and size can work depending on what equipment we got. Okay, so this is what we do. We have the specimen, we fit the specimen here between the two, uh, the top, top and the bottom, as you can see here. This is a different version of the same machine. And then we actually apply the load, the load, tensile load, it will stretch and we just measure, we just measure the start position and then we measure the final position. We just measure how much strain has happened and what's the load. So we just take the readings and then we can plot the graph. When we have a look at um, the specimen, there are different standards for the specimen. Okay, now for the flat specimen, we just measure the gauge length. For the cross-sectional specimen, we still have the gauge length. Okay, and we made the cross-section area. So when we apply the stress to the material, force to the material, material is going to elongate. As it elongate, what will actually happen is it will reduce in the size in cross-sectional area. Cross-sectional area will reduce, but the material will extend. It will elongate. So length will increase, but the cross-sectional area will reduce. Based on that one, we can find out the ductility if there is a massive reduction in cross-sectional area and massive increase in length, it means the material is ductile. If there is a very little, if there is a very little reduction in cross-sectional area and very little increase in length when I elongate the specimen, it means uh, the specimen is not as ductile. Uh, copper, aluminium, they are ductile. Yeah, mild steel. Um, high carbon steel, they are less ductile as compared to copper. Also, we can have a look at, at the failed specimen. So now you can actually have a look. The gauge length is here. We just made the initial gauge length. The initial gauge length, either we use 50 millimeter initial gauge length or 100 millimeter initial gauge length. And we can, when we extend, we just find out the total elongation because we just put the specimen, broken specimen together, and we just Maya from this dot to the other dot to find the gauge length. For the cross-section area, reduction in cross-section area, we maya closer to the failed or broken part where the failure actually happened. So you can see on this one, it's not very ductile. The uh, circular specimen, it's not very ductile. Okay. Now, just to give you an idea, if we have a look at the ductile failure, the ductile failure will be typical cup and cone fracture. 
the cup and cone fracture. So one part will be like a cup and other part will be like a cone. So it will be like cup and a cone is typical of the ductile failure. If there's a shear failure where you can't see any reduction in cross-section area, straight failure, that is called a shear failure or brittle failure. It produced two graphs. They kind of look in the shape, they look exactly the same, but on the X and Y axis, there are different, different things. We can have a graph load and extension, or we can have a graph stress and strain. The load can be in Newton and the extension can be in millimeter. So Newton, millimeter or kilonewton, millimeter. Yeah, we can have that one. The other graph is between stress and strain. The stress is in megapascal, kilopascal, usually in megapascal. And the strain is change in length, percentage change in length. So it's like has no units. The shape of the graph for a typical mild steel will look something like this. This is very typical of a mild steel. You can see up to the first dot all the way up in the load uh, here, you can see the line is straight. This is known as the elasticity limit or the limit of proportionality or the elastic limit. Elastic limit is when load is directly proportional to the strain, when the force is directly proportional to the strain, or when the stress is directly proportional to the strain. After that one, it starts to deviate, kind of start to deviate. Now, for the elastic one, you can see there are two points, one point up here, and the one point, so there are two points, one here and one there. This is typical, this is only in, in mild steel. It doesn't, that graph doesn't form in any other kind of material. So for the top one, if you have a look at here, this is called the upper yield point and the bottom one is called lower yield point. The highest point where the maximum value of the force is somewhere here on the third point where it says necking, just before the necking. At that point, the necking starts, the necking just starts at this point. This is the point when the load is maximum, when the stress is maximum. And this is the point when the material starts to neck. The neck is reduction in cross section area. And that is the load and failure. We break down the graph into two main parts. One is called the elastic region and other is called the plastic region. Elastic region is up to the limit of proportionality Yep, up to the limit of proportionality. And after that one is a plastic region. Plastic region is also known as a permanent deformation. Elastic region is non-permanent deformation. If you remove the force, the material will come back to its original shape. So if I apply a force, yeah, I'm, I remove the force, it comes back. But permanent deformation, you need a lot of force. And the, even if you remove the force, the material will re remain deformed. Okay. Now, if I show you um, a data from one of the tensile testing. Okay. Now, this is the data. Um, it's the load and the extension. The load is 16, extension is that one. So you can actually see, I double the load. I kind of double the extension initially. So we can actually plot that one and diameter is given as well. Yeah, gauge length is given as well. Gauge length is 60 millimeter and the specimen diameter is 10 millimeter. And I'm applying the load in kilonewtons. The more load I apply, the extension, yeah, initially it's linear, but then it doesn't become linear. If we plot a graph, if we plot a graph, we will get a graph like, like that. This graph we got, got, yeah. So if you want to identify, if you want to identify the straight elastic region and plastic region, the elastic region will be where the line is straight line at the end in the hotel. So I will say up till somewhere here, that's a line straight. And after that one, it starts to be there. If I want to find out the maximum load, 
where the magnetic occurs, it's going to be somewhere here. I can actually find the modulus of a lost city if I can convert that load into stress and extension into strain. Okay. Now we have a formula, Young's modulus. Young's modulus or elastic modulus is represented by uppercase E and it's stress over strain. Stress is load over cross-sectional area and strain is extension over original length. The symbol we use for the stress is this, sigma. The unit for the stress is Pascal or megapascal. Megapascal is 10 to the six Pascal. The strain, we use this symbol, it's called epsilon. And it has no units. Strain is change in length or original length, and it has no units. So stress is sigma. We use megapascal, and strain is epsilon. Yeah, a Greek epsilon. Okay. So if we have a look at the elastic modulus, the elastic modulus has a formula. It's stress over strain. So I can write this thing down. Elastic modulus is stress over strain. Now, or actually let's do the other way around. Stress divided by strain. Now stress is force over area divided by strain, which is change in length over original length, L naught. So if I simplify that one, that becomes the F, L naught, A, delta L, change in length. So this is how we can actually find the modulus of elasticity. If we haven't got the strain, or if we haven't got the uh, stress, we can just use that formula. So this is one other way of calculating the elastic modulus. Let me write down the formula here uh, as well. You won't be able to see on the screen, but the one I'm recording. Okay, so stress is force over area. So force over area and it's divided by the strain, change in length, original length. Um, so L naught over the change in length. So this is the formula for the Young's modulus or elastic modulus. Okay, next bit. Let's have a look at the next one. Okay. Now, if, if we want to find um, a graph and we want to find out the elastic part of the graph, we can straight away find the elastic part of the graph by actually plotting the graph. So let's see if I got a graph here and, um, and this is the straight part. And this is, let's say it's one, two, three, four, five. And this is, let's say, um, one millimeter, two millimeter, three millimeter, four millimeter. So these are in millimeters. And these are in, in uh, let's say, megapascal. Oh, no, sorry, not megapascal, uh, kilonewton. So these are in kilonewton. And if I want to find out, if I want to find out uh, the elastic modulus, I have the force, I have the change in length. I don't have the original length and I don't have the area, original area. I, if I got the original diameter, I can find the area, I can put that one here. 
If I got the original length, I can put that one here. And then I can find the elastic modulus. Let's have a look at um, the next question and we see how we can find this one. Next bit. Okay. Let's say we got this question. And diameter is 10 and gauge length is 60. Gauge length is the original length, 60. We know Young's modulus is elastic modulus is stress over strain. If I want to find the stress, the load over cross sectional area. So load, the point I've chosen is this 32 comma 0 0.4. That's the point on the graph I've chosen. So I got the load 32, yeah? And the extension is 0 0.4. Okay, so let's say load 32 and cross-sectional area is 78.5. Yeah, how I find the 78.5? Pi r square. I did the pi r square. Diameter is 10, so it will give me the cross-sectional area. And I can convert that one into stress, which is now cross-sectional area load is in kilonewton and cross-sectional area is in, um, cross-sectional area is in millimeter. So I can have 0.4, 0 0.407 kilonewton per millimeter square. Now, remember, Newton per millimeter square is actually a megapascal. So if you got 400 and 0 0.407 kilonewton yeah, over millimeter square, I can convert this thing as 407 Newton over millimeter square. Yeah, I can write that because I can get rid of the kilo. And Newton over millimeter square is actually megapascal. So that is 407 megapascal of the stress. That's a quite a lot of stress. The strain has no units. The extension is 0 0.4 millimeter and the original length is 60 millimeters. So it will give me a strain of 0 0.0067. Now, I want to find the Young's modulus. Young's modulus is stress over strain. The value of the stress, I got 0 0.407. And the value for the strain, I got 0 0.0067. That will give me 60.7 kilonewton per millimeter square. Now, remember, I got 60, 60, times 10 to the three because a kilo, Newton over millimeter, Newton over millimeter square, I can just rather write that one as 60 times 10 to the three, and that will become a mega Pascal. And you know the mega Pascal is 10 to the six, but there is another 10 to the three. 10 to the six and 10 to the three becomes 10 to the nine. So I go 60 times 10 to the nine. Now, 10 to the 9 is known as gigapascal. Giga is 10 to the 9. Yeah. So we can convert that one into gigapascal. So Young's modulus usually are in gigapascal. The stress are usually in megapascal. Yeah. So this is 60.7 um, gigapascal, which is 10 to the 9. OK. Now, then there's a thing called proof stress. Proof stress is, is, a, is a, um, quite a strange concept to grasp, but it's a stress um, that causes a certain percentage increase uh, in a gauge length. So usually we take a 2% uh, uh, increase in the gauge length, and that's how we find that, that um, uh, stress. Okay. Now, how we find the stress, we draw a parallel line to a straight part of the graph. And then we can take that one, the value from the vertical axis, if I show you how. Let's say I want to find out the proof stress of load. Okay. So what I do is I want to find out the proof stress at 0 0.056. Okay. So this is one millimeter, 1% 1 of the gauge length. So I'm finding at 1% of the gauge length. Now one, the gauge length is 56 millimeter gauge length was there. So 1% is how much? It's going to be 0 0.056. So I just plot a line. Now I need to make sure I plot a parallel line. So line has to be parallel to that one. This dotted line, parallel to the solid line initially. 
after that one obviously is not going to parallel. And it will cross the solid line, the solid stress strain curve at a certain point. After I got this bit, what can I do? I go to the y-axis and I read the value from there. And that will give me like, let's say it's 260 from here, 260 Newton per millimeter square, which is 260 megapascal. So the proof stress at 0.1% uh, is given as 260 megapascal. Why it is important? Sometimes we want material, um, it's safe for the material to elongate like 1% or 0.1%. Yeah, we, that's a tolerance. So we said, okay, if the material elongate 1%, at which stress is going to elongate? And let's say it's the equipment machinery can go at that much stress. So if it goes at that much stress, it elongate 1%, the machine is still going to work fine. Okay. For example, pistons in the car, when they are heated up, they are under stress and they do expand. They do expand at certain stress, but that stress doesn't make it to stop function functioning properly. So we can, we can still use the component. But if it's more than that, we know the material will jam, the material will not work, the system will break. So we want to make sure that what, at what stress it will elongate that much. And then the material, the component, the equipment, the machinery is still, uh, will still work. Okay. Now we use either 0.1% proof stress or we use 0.2% proof stress. Now 0.2% proof stress, we let's say is whatever is the gauge length. Yeah, gauge length was 56 millimeter. So 2% of that one is going to be uh, around, uh, well, 0.1, this is 0.1% is 0.001. So you can find 0.2%. When, if you want to find 0.2%, just plot that straight line and do that one. So now, Okay, uh, this is just showing you how we can get it straight from the graph. Okay, next one, um, next one. Tensile strength. Tensile strength is maximum load divided by the cross-sectional area. Maximum load is the highest point on the curve. The top of the curve is called the maximum point. It's also known as the UTS, ultimate tensile stress, ultimate tensile strength. Okay. Okay, the next bit is called the creep. Now, creep is a um, tensile test occurring at different temperature, usually high temperature. If I got a piece of plastic and I'm trying to stretch a piece of plastic, I need a lot of force to stretch it, for example. But if I increase the temperature, I just put that one in a kind of like oven and increase the temperature 100 degrees, now it will make the material soft and I will, I will stretch it easily at low uh, forces, at low stress level. Now the creep will increase when the material is subject to high temperature. The creep is higher for the material with low melting point. Now the issue with the creep is, for example, the tensile strength for um, tensile strength for the material for the steel is around 200, more than 200 uh, megapascal. It goes all the way up. Elastic modulus is more than 210 uh, gigapascal. And it can, let's say there's a material, a special material that can fail at let's say uh, 500 megapascal of the stress. That is where it start to neck. Now, if the temperature increases, rather it failing at 500, it might fail at 100 megapascal of stress. This is exactly what happened in Chernobyl when uh, the nuclear reactor, um, the core just blown off. The reason it happened is because the temperature, there was not enough coolant, temperature went up so high. The steel walls were designed to protect it that at that much stress, but because the steel got really hot, when the steel got really hot, it was no longer able to withstand the stresses it was designed. 
the steel becomes soft. So rather it failing at certain stresses, it fail at a quite low value of the stresses. Then we got our terminology called fatigue. We will have a whole session on creep and fatigue, the whole lecture. Now the fatigue is a phenomena, failure phenomena that occurs after a repeated cycle of loading and unloading. Loading and unloading. For example, the laptops here, I am kind of loading and unloading the hinges here. I apply the load and unload the hinges. Your ball points, you got spring in the ball point, you just load and unload. You just stress and de-stress the company. The aeroplanes, when they go high altitude, different pressure. Low altitude, different pressure. So it's loading and unloading cycle. Uh, submarine, loading and unloading. When it goes all the way uh, uh, under the sea, high stress is high loading. Up, low stress is low loading. So this is under repeated cycle. Now with this repeated cycle, the issue is the crack will start to form. It's very difficult to see the crack or to find the crack because of the fatigue. Fatigue crack takes years to develop, to form. But then when it's formed, it takes minutes or seconds to just propagate and just cause a catastrophic failure. It's quite quick. It's quite uh, important to, to have some kind of check and balance, quality assurance to identify the fatigue failures because fatigue failures can cause catastrophic damages, usually airplane ships and everything. And in, in especially in um, shipping industry, especially it's quite important, especially in chemical industry, uh, aerospace industry is quite important to identify the creep. Um, and identify the soy fatigue failure. Okay, a um, few things we can do. We can in, uh, periodic inspection. Uh, we can avoid the corrosion, sharp corners. We can avoid uh, smooth surface finish. Uh, we, it helps to reduce that one. Um, every material is tested before they make the pen, before the pen comes in market, the spring in the in the pen, they actually compress and decompress. There's a machine that actually put the spring and it just does that one. And there's there's a number of cycle. How many times is compressing decompressive is recorded? It's not a person, but it's just an automated machine. And after a while, when the machine uh, that failed, they record how many um, after how many times compression decompress cycle it can go, and then it fails. So they actually kind of assume that you are going to press compress and decompress that one for let's say 70,000 times. So they need, need to put a spring that can last at least double that amount. Yep. Yeah. So this is, they do that one with samples. Um, every maybe every million sample, every 10,000 sample. So then they may want to make sure, otherwise the pen won't be good. After uh, you start writing it after like 20, 50 or maybe 100, 200, it stopped writing because of the spring has cracked. Okay, now the next bit of testing is the NDT. Sometimes it's called NDT, sometimes it's called NDE, non-destructive testing, non-destructive evaluation. Okay, why we use that one? Um, we want to make sure, we want to find the properties if that thing is good. For example, in welding, you want to find out if the weld is perfect, you do non-destructive testing. When you do non-destructive testing, you can find out if the weld is sound or there is a flaw, the defect in the weld, and then you can just change it or do proper remedy. Okay, plus the component is still good for uh, purpose. We can also test the component that are in use. For example, there is a chemical plant and that's been in use. So we don't have to, we can find out, uh, are there any cracks? in the chemical plant, in the chemical tanker or something like that. We can do that one, but it's still going to be used. Different types of the uh, testing we actually use. Uh, one is called the painted testing, is used to find the surface cracks. 
uh, it's quite simple. We use either the oil and chalk test, which is a traditional version of that one, or now we use like color dye test. So there are multiple steps involved. We got the crack, we just clean the surface, we spray it to the fluorescent spray, yeah. And then we let it seep into the crack. Then we just wipe it clean. And then we look under the UV light to find out where the crack is. Then we got the magnetic particle testing, MPT or MPI. It detects the flaws closer to the surface, but uh, under the surface, it can detect under the surface or closer to the surface. The material to be tested need to magnetize and obviously after demagnetize as well. So we can only use that one on magnetic material or the ferrous material. So we sprinkle the magnetic material and we can actually find the magnetic, uh, then we apply a magnetic field. We sprinkle the magnetic powder. And if there is a defect, the magnetic particle will stick to that bit. And then we can say, oh, here you go. That's the problem. That's the problem area. Then we got a uh, eddy current testing. Okay. Eddy current testing we use for non-ferrous metals, uh, electric conductive metals. Eddy current is a phenomena. Uh, we will have a whole session on these one in detail, but just to give you an idea, eddy current is a um, when we when we supply a crunch to a material, we just have a coil and we let the AC crunch. It doesn't work with the DC. AC crunch passes through the coil. This coil will create uh, a magnetic field around it. This magnetic field will pass on to other material. And when the magnetic field will pass on to the material, it will create its own electric field as a result, like kind of like a wireless charging. And these two magnetic fields will interact. When they interact, we will get kind of results. When we get the results, we can actually find out what kind of defects are there. It's, it's uh, difficult to do. It's difficult to interpret. The issue with that one is they are difficult to interpret the results of these testing. Then we go ultrasonic testing. Ultrasonic testing, we send an ultrasonic ray, uh, waves, ultrasonic um, sound waves. The sound waves goes strike and come back. And we also already know the distance, the thickness of the component. Now, what actually happened is if there's a defect inside the material, it will go down, it will bounce. It will just bounce from that defect. And then we can record the time taken for it to bounce back. We already know the speed of the sound and we can find that bit. If we are doing that one on the side with no defect, it will take more time to travel and then come back. So we have a transmitter and a receiver. Usually right now, we have transmitter and receiver as in one probe, rather having two different probes. So if there's a fault, we will have lower peak values. Like if you can see the normal peak values are the high one because it goes all the way up, down, and then all the way up, yeah? The sound waves goes all the way down to the surface. But if there's a defect, the peaks are small. And then based on that one, we can actually locate the shape, the size, the exact location of the defect. The next one is the radiography, the X-ray testing. Now, there are different ways of generating an X-ray. Uh, we can generate the x-rays uh, by high, passing a high electric current, or we can generate the x-rays by, uh, or rather using the x-rays, we can, we can have the gamma rays or the radioactive, using the radioactive cobalt material. Okay, so we actually kind of, the old TVs, the cathode ray tubes, the big fat TVs, they have this uh, CRT, cathode ray tube, which is, we pass the current, and the current actually generates um, very high um, energy electrons which pass from one point to the point. So it's kind of like a similar process. Okay, so let's have a look at that one. 
So we pass a, a current to the cathode ray and the current actually excites the electrons. The electrons will hit that tungsten and it will be deflected back. And at the bottom, we put a material item under test. So the item under test, we put the material here to be tested. If there is a defect, the X-rays will pass through easily. If there is a micro wide, wide air bubble or a gap or a crack, it will pass through. And the less of the radiation or the X-rays will be absorbed by the material. And then you put a photographic plate at the bottom. If there was a defect here the on the photographic plate, it will be shown as a fault, as a dark spot. The reason it's a dark spot is because all the radiation, most of the radiation has passed because there's a defect and it will expose the photographic film more. The more the exposure is, the dark the, the film is. With the light, it means that it's not been exposed. You can see on the side, it's, uh, it's a dark red, a dark, sorry, dark black rectangle, which means, yeah, there, that's what it is. And there are two holes. You can see where the holes, it actually straight away went to no absorption by the material. So photographic plates are fully developed and hence black. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, I will um, 